Welcome to the Garden Show. Uh, welcome to Garden with Peggy. I'm Peggy Ballister Howells, and we're here with my husband Tommy, who's who's pushing my buttons over there. And of course, we have this little guy, Alfalfa, affectionately known as Alfie, who uh, keeping me company up here. He jumped up on the table all by himself, so I guess he knows it's time for him to be a star. I want to remind everybody that we are on uh, Facebook and YouTube and, uh, oh, we're on Facebook Reels now and Instagram and TikTok, any of those things. And that if you could like and subscribe, that would be great. And the phone number, 888-399-7344. Uh, that's Peggy, P-E-G-I, 7344. So 888-399-7344. And I also want to remind everybody that the plant exchange is May 25th, which is a Saturday of Memorial Day weekend. And anyone who is interested in coming should uh, text me or email me and I will give you the location of, for that event. And the way that works is you bring whatever it is that you want to trade, any kind of seedlings you may have started or houseplants you may have propagated or any. Uh, shrubbery you may have propagated or even shrubbery that you've dug out and divided or perennials that you divided to just give away or pots, tools, anything, uh, garden gnomes, whatever it is that you may have that um, you think would be something that someone else could use. And you just bring it and you put it out and um, everybody brings one food item, which is a food item, hopefully that can be um, finger food. And I'm hoping not everybody brings cookies and desserts, but uh, some cookies and desserts are good. Uh, I usually bring, I usually prepare hot dogs. Uh, that's easy. People can pick them up and put on their mustard or relish. Some people even put on ketchup, which I find really upsetting, but you know, everyone to their own and, uh, but easy to eat. So if you can think of uh, something to bring, that'd be great. And there's no cost involved. It's just you know, a fun day. I'm hoping that my husband will be playing music that day. Um, a lot of details still yet to be worked out, but I'm looking forward to that being a fun day. So I'm hoping Nancy will give us a call because I have some pictures of her night sky. So we'll talk about that. Uh, but let's go right to the slides and we'll start with this week at Tiny Farm. I gave the number a couple of times. 888-399-7344. That's Peggy, P-E-G-I. Okay, so let's start with the slides. This is Alfie and Juniper, who were supervising my efforts yesterday while I was working on the blueberry bed. And uh, every year at this time of year, we weed the blueberry bed. Uh, there's always a lot of overwintering weeds. Uh, chickweed is a big one, but there's other weeds out there too. Uh, so we weeded and then mulch it heavily. And you may remember a couple weeks ago, my son brought me a whole truckload of really nice, fine uh, wood chips. And Tommy's been loading up the wheelbarrow. I've been doing the weeding and some of the spreading, and he's been doing the dumping. And I would say, what, we're about halfway? We're about halfway. But these two were supervising our efforts, make sure we were doing a good job. And um, they're, they're always entertaining. Okay, not sure what's going on here. Can we make the pictures bigger? Much bigger. All right, this is a panoramic view of um, the Garden of Ancient Ruins. And this garden is on the side of the house. And some of it was there when we uh, first purchased the house. And some of it was added that we added things like there's some a couple of slate steps. They were completely buried. And the forsythias were there and the myrtle was there uh, and the daffodils were there. But everything else uh, we have added, all the statuary and the, uh, the benches and that we added all that. But it's a, a really a lovely place to... And it changes constantly at this time of year with the daffodils and the forsythias and the myrtle. It's um, really lovely. Can we make that bigger just for a minute, please, so that everybody can get a better view of what that's going to what that really looks like? Yeah, there we go. Um, it's a lovely space, kind of a almost a meditation garden, but 
it's a combination of the efforts made by Mrs. Lang, who lived here and gardened here for 75 years, and what we did to try to maintain that and restore some of it, and then put our own personal taste added on to that. Next. Oh, um, I don't know about you guys, but I have seen more of the big magnolias that have been frosted. This is Susan. Again, she's part of a series of dwarf late blooming magnolias. Um, I had Betty at Blooming Acres. Couldn't find another Betty, but found Susan. And this one has those beautiful deep purple buds. They are in good shape. They have not been frosted and they will be opening any minute. So late I am a big fan of late blooming magnolias because when the earlier blooming ones get frosted, they are really, really ugly. Now this one is never going to get as big as some of those magnificent early blooming ones, but uh, it'll. I've never had either Betty or Susan be frosted, so that's kind of important. Oh, this beauty is blooming in the greenhouse, and it is the first amaryllis to bloom. And I didn't even know I had this one. Um, it's a beautiful, I don't know what you would call it, white with kind of red variegation on it, I guess to say, but, um, it must've been one of the ones that was, that I picked up at the plant exchange last year, or maybe even the year before, because, um, it's possible this is the first time it's bloomed. I'm not sure. I've had some that haven't bloomed yet, but, um, it's a beauty. Oh, this is Flying Dragon. It's related to, it's a Poncira, and it's obviously very twisted and contorted. I would not want to get into an argument with this bush because you definitely lose all those curly twisted thorns. I think this must be the plant that they, uh, that was around uh, the tower of where Sleeping Beauty was because the prince couldn't cut through all the brambles. And I think this was it. This was it. And I'm look, I'm showing you this because first of all, it's it's looking really good and it looks real healthy. But I think those are flower buds. It's never bloomed for me before. So I will keep you posted as to whether that one's going to, if they're actually going to open up and be flowers. And we showed you, was it last week? I guess um, that we divided a rose bush, a miniature rose that was um, in the garden and I decided it, it needed to go in containers. And when we pulled it out of the ground, there were two, actually there was a third one that was dead, um, but there were two viable different actual plants. And so I potted them up and look at all the new growth on them. I put them back outside right next to where they had been planted. There's not a lot of room in the greenhouse, but I figured they were, we were through the worst of winter and they had survived outside. So I figured let's just leave them outside till I have a little bit more room in the greenhouse. And they seem to be doing quite well. So, ah, this little plant. Can we make this one bigger, please? Um, so this one is the sea onion and it's um, a really weird succulent. And we had pulled out that plant from a the mother plant and you can see that that nice long tendril on the left is it, that's new that's an that's grown since we potted it up didn't have much in the way of roots but it it was very firm and it roots pretty easily and you can see it's it's very oniony looking it's a very strange plant but it's one that I've always enjoyed and I've had it probably uh, 25 to 30 years so um Botanical name is Boia, if you're looking for one. All right, the peonies are up. Those of you that are peony lovers, I believe this is the peony that was given to me by Anne Marie. Um, I, I think I have several coming up. Um, and uh, they're all sending, come, starting with red foliage, even though the one that she gave me was uh, actually has white flowers. Um, it's, this is either the one from Anne Marie or this is the yellow one. Not sure which. Um, we'll know sooner or later, but the peonies are up and doing very well. There's also ground cover coming up through that. That's a euphorbia ground cover. I got to yank that out. I'm trying to reduce the amount of that ground cover I have. Where I like it, I love it. But when it comes up or I don't want it, it's extremely annoying. Isn't that beautiful? 
He's working in the blueberry bed and this is a lichen that's growing. It doesn't hurt the plant and it's just lives on the surface. It's not a saprophyte. It's not sucking the juices out of the plant. It's just kind of sitting there. And I think it's really, really a beautiful example of it. Love the color, love the texture. Um, it's on a couple of the plants, but this one is definitely the best. Oh, my husband found this picture. Uh, this is not a, this is not a technically this week picture, but it is, um, can we make that one nice and big so everybody can get the full benefit of this ridiculous picture? Um, this was taken when we actually started the blueberry bed, which was, um, <clears throat> five years ago, four years ago, four or five years ago. And this is the bed uh, inside the horseshoe shaped driveway. And this was all very intentional because you don't want to lime uh, the blueberry bed. You want to keep the soil rather acidic, more acidic than you would keep it for other things. So I wanted the blueberries to be in a bed where they would be treated uniquely, just themselves. Now there's other things in there and if they do well, great. And if they don't, well, the main purpose of the bed is for the blueberries. So we'll, we'll manage. Um, and those are all slates that we found laying around on the property <laughs> that we made a path through the center to make it easier for harvesting blueberries. And there's other scattered stones, but this one, my husband has labeled head blueberry gardener, and it's both very entertaining and slightly embarrassing. Ah, oh, the pink daffodils. Uh, they're really interesting because they open up yellow and then as they mature, they turn pink. So all the pink ones I have added to the bed and they are really coming into their own. You know, originally they, they did look all yellow, but as they mature, they turn pink and I think they're really pretty. And our first tulips, also pink. Um, they look really nice in the bed with the, the pink daffodils. Um, you can see they're not uniform in size. And that's one of the problems with tulips is that the first year you'll get, in most cases, you will get tall, robust, beautiful tulips of uniform size and height, um, after which they begin to deteriorate even if they're in blazing sun and you take proper care of them, um, tulips only last about three to five years. And they, the second year they'll come up less uniform. And maybe the third year you'll have a couple of skips and eventually you will want to replace them. I think this might be the third year for these, um, but the color is still really beautiful. And that's it. Do we have any callers? No, no callers. All right. Well, you know what I'm going to do? Um, let's do this. I've had these on the, on the table for like how many weeks, three or four weeks. I picked this up at the, uh, at the dollar store. I was actually looking for, um, the plastic dome type things, um, and, that were supposed to be at the dollar store. Uh, but I haven't, they, they haven't shown up there. So, um, which is kind of disappointing, but this very nice plant hanger and they had them in like white and natural. And I think you could actually untie this knot if you wanted to and lower it a little bit to make it a little bit longer, but they're a dollar and a quarter, um, at the dollar store. So I thought that was, um, that was kind of worthwhile and, uh, yep. Yeah, dollar and a quarter. And then this thing, we're going to open this up. I'm really not sure exactly what this is. It's a metal plant hanger and it's supposed to be adaptable to any kind of pot. So we're just going to open this up and see what it is because I think it might be useful. And again, it's only a dollar and a quarter. Okay. So here, here it is. And it has little clips on the bottom, see little clips on the bottom. And the idea is that you can use this on any plastic pot. And the, the idea is that you poke a hole in the lip to slip this through. 
and it wouldn't take much to poke a hole. I think you could use a very a, a drill and, and you could do it that way, or you could even possibly uh, heat up an owl, A-W-L, or that all, is it all better pronunciation, but you could heat one up and just, you know, make a hole that way, melt a hole. Um, but then these would fit through the lip. And um, I thought that was kind of interesting, you know, a different kind of look. And you could then um, put it in whatever plastic pot it's already in and make yourself a hanger that way. So inexpensive, uh, pretty easy to use and available at your dollar store. So um, they didn't have the plastic bell jars that I really wanted, but I found these and, and I'm, I'm going to try them. Okay. Any callers yet? All right. Let's give the phone number. It's 888-399-7344. Really hoping that Nancy will call in so we can, she can tell us about her, her trip and the beautiful pictures that she sent in. Um, I don't think we're waiting on anybody else. Let's do, unless, uh, of course, um, Danny from Atuchin wants to call in because that would be fun. Uh, and let's go to the international report, please. Sorry. Okay, this is Danny. And <laughs> she is in Taiwan at her high school reunion. And she went to this cow lily farm and if you look closely you can see she's got a pair of scissors in her hand you're allowed to harvest the cow lilies and cow lilies are uh if i had to pick i would have to say they're my favorite flower of course you know very often i will say what my favorite flower is whatever is in bloom at the moment but um ever since i was a little girl and i was in the attic of the giant victorian house that most of us grew up in um and i found my mother's wedding picture and she was carrying a bouquet of these um i always thought that they were the most beautiful elegant thing i'd ever seen i was very little at the time and it has stuck with me so this is the field of calla lilies i don't know that i'd want to be standing in all that that water to have to harvest them maybe accessing them from the other side it's not quite so wet but that i mean they just go on forever. How cool is that? That's really, really magnificent. And this is what she collected for herself, which is just really very, very special. I hope she had a great time. I think she's home now, but look, is there a million? I mean, it looks like there could be a million. Okay. Also on the international scene, the Blueberry, a blueberry grown in uh, <clears throat> South Wales. Is that New New South Wales? Breaks the Guinness World Record as the world's heaviest. It's dark blue, about the size of a golf ball, and weighs 10 times as much as your average blueberry. I look at that. It's like ping pong ball size or golf ball size. It's ginormous. Now, apparently this, um, this guy, Brad Hawking, was in a town called Corindi, and he said that the fruit wasn't even an abnormality, and this variety is called Eterna, and there were about 20 blueberries of a similar size when the berry was picked. So I don't know if we're, if they're, we're ever going to see them coming up from that far away, but um, I would imagine that someone may try to import the plants or buy the plants and start growing them that big. I mean, with, could you eat the whole thing? You'd have to bite into it. it would make great for blueberry juice or cooking, but they're they're kind of big and beautiful. And this is this is the guy who uh, has been growing them, and it looks like he's got them all growing in a in a greenhouse or under some kind of protection. I don't know if that protection from insects or maybe from birds, um, but they're under some kind of protection and they are quite enormous. Is that the last one? Is that the last slide? 
So we can hopefully look forward to seeing them. If I come across the opportunity to make such a purchase, I will add one to my blueberry garden or two. It would be fun to have something that's that huge. I, we have, what, about 30 blueberry bushes out there, give or take, all different varieties. So some early, some mid-season, some late. Um, we really don't need any more blueberries. Last year, we had so many blueberries, we didn't know what to do with them all. But um, nonetheless, they uh, I, I would I would make room for one of those just, just for the fun of it all. So again, I'm going to put out a all points bulletin for Nancy to give us a call so that we she, can. She commented. Oh, where did she comment? Okay. Uh, oh no. Oh no. Uh, she's not going to be able to call in. So maybe I will save, uh, I will save that for next week so that she can call in and talk about it. Comment. Okay. Let's say, by the way, Icelanders imported lupine to help with erosion and now they are considered invasive. Oh, okay. Really? Lupine? That's surprising. I wouldn't. Well, they do like cold climates. So that actually makes sense. Um, lupines do really well in Maine and they don't do really well here because um, what happens is you plant them, they're supposed to be perennial and they may last a year or two. But then what will happen is you'll have a mild winter and they'll they'll think because the temperatures have warmed up, which they don't do in colder climates, they start to emerge and then the weather gets cold and they have no protection against that. So they die. Um, I have another comment oh. about plant hangers. Oh, let's go back to the plant hangers. The other comment is my plant hangers are cheap net bags to support melons this year. We are the first time melon growers on a trellis. I looked into various ways to support them. Um, uh, in the old days, I'd say use use pantyhose. Nobody wears pantyhose anymore. Does anybody, I mean, does anybody, I don't understand why not, because I would hate to be wearing a pair of new high heels and be prancing around without some protection because that would be blister city, but nobody, but I don't wear high heels anymore. So I don't have to worry about it, but it just seems awfully uncomfortable. Um, but yeah, nobody's using pantyhose. So net, net bags would be a good thing that would work. Uh, oh, you know what might work? Oh, I just got inspiration. Um, onion bags. Onion bags are like a net, right? When you buy onions. So you could definitely um, modify an onion bag and maybe use it on the melons with uh, with some sort of either a twist tie or a zip tie, something to hold it on to whatever the support is. But um, yeah, onion bags, that might be worth looking into to try to save because um, that would give you good uh, air circulation and it would be easy enough to tie them on and everybody gets onion bags. And I've always just, you know, ripped them apart and then thrown them away. But if you cut them carefully, then you could reuse them to hold melons. So there's an idea, unless the person who commented has a very specific net bag that they use and would like to share that information where they access it, that would be great. So who do we have? Oh, it's Danny from Metuchen. Hey, Danny girl. Good morning, Peggy. How are you? Good morning. Good. How are you? Um, I'm good. Did you have a great time? Yes, we had a wonderful trip. And um, the picture that you just showed on the show is only a small portion of the plants that I saw there. Um, as you see, there is a subtropical climate there. Everything, flowers just grows in abundance out in the wild. And I keep on commenting to Dave, all the plants that we try to nurture in our house, in the greenhouse, and try to get them to grow. They grow wild everywhere. And it just makes me so jealous. Well, you know, for me, and, and maybe this will help you with your jealousy, if I lived in a climate like that, I'd be dead. Because you never get a break. So, yes, all those things grow easily, but they grow year round. I need my winter um, off. You I, I need my winter off to do other things. So um, if I had to, that's what Tommy keeps talking about wanting to move to Florida and I, I don't want to move to Florida. It'll kill me. 
because you have to. Well, actually, what I noticed are plants are just sitting out there in pots. One thing, the last time I was back in Taiwan was 2019. I went to the city. I walked around. Just people have pots and pots and pots of desert rose just sitting in the front. Doesn't look like it's been attend, you know, tended to or careful. It just and they're in giant sizes and full of flowers. I'm sure they're they gorgeous sit, too. Because I think, yes, they're. I think the the humidity in the air that's what does it. Oh yeah, and the lack. You think of, about it, it's a desert rose. And the lack of fluctuation. And lack of what? Plants, plants, right. especially that are prefer a warmer climate are not crazy about temperature fluctuations, you know, and, and here, yeah. even if we, you know, try to keep them in a greenhouse, uh, most people, myself included, let the temperature drop pretty cool at night just to save on heating costs. And they're not, Correct. it doesn't necessarily make them really happy. So the fact that the fluctuation in a climate like that is dramatically less is really encourages them to be at their best. Um, but I'm going to stick with my theory that if I was in that kind of environment, it, it would kill me. So, I'm, uh, so I'm, I'm you just go to the park. Yes. You just go I'm, to the park. I'm just, you know, I'm a Jersey girl. I'm going to stay here. I'm going to have my winters off so I can paint, tr uh, cherry trees in my stairwell and do tile projects and m make bears and, you know, do all the other things that I like to do. And, um, uh, and, then garden like crazy when gardening season comes. So I think it, if you had a greenhouse and I know not everybody does, and I didn't have one until relatively recently in my career, that it really does create a little bit more balance so that the off season isn't as off. And, right. and, and that helps me. And I know not everyone is fortunate enough to be in that position, but then not everyone has made a career out of this. So for me, it has uh, been very helpful and both mentally and from a practical point of view, it, it has gone a long way in helping kind of create some balance for me. But it, those pictures, how many, did they ever tell you how many calla lily plants were at that place? Because it looked like millions. Oh, um, no, they didn't. So just, you know, this is on, on a hillside of a you know, mountain pretty close to the city, Taipei. And this is only one farm. There are numbers and numerous other farms. The and way do they, they ship they, them? Do they harvest them and ship them? Is that what they do with all those? Yeah, they must have. And also they, they do them as a tourist spot. So people will come like what you, you know, you, you saw that I did. You pay for, you know, I think probably amounts to like three to five dollars us dollars you can go walk around you can take pictures and and then um you're allowed to take a bunch of is there a limit pre -pick, pre -pick as to how many cut. you can take yeah well no and then you, i guess you can cut your own they they charge you differently and you know we went with the driver he negotiated for me so so i didn't get the pre-cut one i get to pick what i want oh nice and i you know, yeah, you know me, I, I, even though I wasn't able to keep it, I gave it to someone that I was meeting for, but I picked the one that just opened up and right. even the owner commented on that the flowers you picked are really nice. <laughs> I, you know, I proud, I'm very proud of myself that, you know, how to recognize how to pick something to last for a long time. So, well, we had that discussion yes, last to, week. I don't know if you were here yet last week but you know how to pick a proper easter lily again you know you want to pick them when they're just maybe one is open and the rest are buds and and the same with the calla lilies just open just open and then you'll get the right. biggest bang for the buck and not even completely open you can pick them as they are opening but once they're mature enough and they start opening they will continue to open so you know that's what you want to do right. so I'm, I'm so glad you had a good time and it's almost worth it yeah, to go to so, Taiwan so, just to see that place because it was so impressive, so impressive and so, so beautiful. I, I'm, yeah, I would. Uh, I would also just introduce that I was explaining 
the, that area was full of um, natural springs. So the, the flower beds actually set up almost like a terrace in big, uh, big rectangle spots. And then so they feed the water from the top terrace. And then the water just runs trickle down, down right. by gravity. And then I was told that the younger ones are, um, has water in the bed. But more mature plants, they actually drain, drain the water out. And so, so I guess that's where they can harvest them. Right. That makes more sense. More easily. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, right. So, I, they can, so I think that they can control how much water is in each bed. Well, downstairs here um, in the hallway um, is the hallway of ancestors. And we have pictures of my parents and my grandparents and Tommy's grandparents. And um, <clears throat> there's my mother's wedding picture. So I will take a picture of the picture and show her with her beautiful bouquet of calla lilies. And I will share that next week. And then you will understand why I got so attached to them at such a young age before I even knew anything about flowers or plants or anything. I just thought that they were so beautiful and my mother was so elegant. And so that is the image I like to keep in my head. So I will share that with you guys next week. Okay. Um, actually, I'm not done traveling yet. We're on our way up to uh, Northern Maine to see the solar eclipse tomorrow. Right, I know a few people are doing that. Um, but you can see it here. Can't you see it here? Partial. You can just see it partially here. She's going to. Partial, yeah. So where we are heading, can... hopefully, yes, hopefully we get a clear sky to uh, be able to see it. Because we have planned this thing for a long time, even before we went to Taiwan. And uh, we keep on changing our destination because the cloud coverage. And we made this final decision last night at about 930. So now we're on the way. All right. Well, have fun. And, and, um, yes. and so you'll be back by next week. Or are you going to stay? Uh, no, we're going to be. Yeah. No, no, we actually do other traveling. So. All right. Well, have I, fun. I will watch your show as often as I can or as hard as I could. Okay. So, well, then I will say yeah, we the did. Picture. We actually watched the. Yeah, I actually watched you when I was in Taiwan one day, too. Oh. <laughs> well, I'm honored that you would take time of your vacation to watch the show. All right, so I will save my mother's picture till the week after when you're back. So you drive safe. Okay. Enjoy the, Thank um, you. the, the eclipse, and we'll see you when you get back. All righty. All right, thanks for Have calling a good in. Day. All right, bye-bye now. Okay, bye-bye. You well, got an answer to your onion. Oh, okay. We got an answer. Um, we got all kinds of comments today. Oh, there we go. Onion bags work great. We purchased a hundred like onion, like onion net bags off of Amazon for six ninety five, and about the same for shipping. Okay, but onion. So onion bags are if you need a lot. Obviously, nobody eats that many onions, but. Um, if you just need a few, then onion bags, but that's great. So on Amazon. Okay, good to know. Thank you for sharing that. All right, so what should we do next? I should give the phone number. It's 888-399-7344. Obviously, Alfie here is becoming um, much more of a star. He, he keeps popping up here on his own to be in front of the camera. All right, so what should we do next? Um, let's do the pruning hibiscus. Oh, we have a phone call? Who is it? Oh, Chris from Scotch Plains. It's, he's, uh, we haven't talked to him in a couple of weeks, so it'll be nice to hear from him. Okay, Chris, are you with us? Hey, good morning. Um, sorry. Oh, we're having button trouble. Hold on. Good morning. Chris? Try this way. All right, we're going to try one more one more way. Sorry, our buttons are not cooperating. Hi, Chris. There That's you fun. are. Good morning. I was having I was having technical <laughs> difficulties once again. I thought it was Peggy. No, it was us. I, no, we think it was us. So not your fault. But thank you oh. for yeah. It was us. We were having trouble. So we have so many buttons. Okay. We have so many buttons. It is really easy to make you know press the wrong one or one is being cranky. Then it takes a second to figure it out. 
So what can I do for you today? How are you? Did you have a good Easter? Well, I'm doing, I'm doing good. I just wanted to give you an update on the uh, early tomato uh, experiment. Uh, so on March the 10th, I uh, grew two varieties of early uh, tomatoes. One was the Johnny's variety, the BHN589, and the other one that was recommended uh, from Bob uh, from Piscataway last year, Red Racer. And uh, Red Racer is, uh, race, is racing ahead. Uh, it looks bigger than the BHN. Both look healthy. Both look pretty good. On the seed packet, the Johnny's tomato uh, days to maturity is 75. And on the uh, Red Racers, it is uh, actually 57 days. So uh, they're both doing well. Time will tell what produces first. But I just wanted to give you an update on, uh, on that, though. Well, I appreciate that, Chris. I have very upsetting news about my BHNs. The birds ate them. I put them out during oh the day and was bringing them in at mm -hmm. night where Tommy was doing most of the lugging. But um, I had several plants that were doing really well. And I went out and one big pot that had two of them in it, the, the top was completely gone. And they had just been oh, snipped off. And then so I kept them in the greenhouse for a little while. And the other one that was doing really well, because I had three pots. The other one that was doing really mm -hmm. well, I kept it inside till it got a little bigger. And then with the slightly warmer weather we've had this week, I put it out again. And some bird got that one, too. So now I have none. Oh, God. I'll, I'll have to protect mine from, <laughs> from the birds. And that's a good thing to know about. Yeah, they just snip them off what they do. And it's the first time I've had that experience here at Tiny Farm. But what they do when the plants are young and tender is they, at this time of year, usually you put them out so much later, um, is they use the mm -hmm. little soft foliage to line their nests oh okay so they pluck off anything that's really tender and uh, and also i had them potted in in compost and there may have been some seeds mm -hmm. in there or something that maybe they were drawn to that and then they just pluck them off so um so i have none I, they were you know oh. i was very optimistic that but uh, and then I had never been able to find the, the cloches, you know, the that I had wanted to use. I had never been able to find them. So I was moving them in and out. I thought if I could protect them, I could leave them out. But I was never able to find enough to, to use. So they were doing OK, you know, moving them in and out. They weren't doing OK when they were beheaded by a bird. So uh, that's that's such a such a disappointment. No yeah. doubt. Yes, um, it is. I share a disappointment. So anyway, so I have none. Yeah, I'm I, sorry to say. I, yeah, the the last time I called in, I was raving about the uh, how much I love uh, Jimmy Nardello peppers, and I uh, I you know was raving on and on about it, and I literally lost my Jimmy Nardello peppers. I planted them. I think I planted them, and I can't find them in my basement. So the whole flat. Um, needless to say, my uh, my organization is not as good as it might be, uh, but for the life of me, I cannot find them. So I don't know if I lost them someplace, if somebody moved them or exactly what, but uh, I'll have to see if I can purchase some Jimmy Nardello's come back. Well, I did start some. I'm not sure if they're up yet. I did start some. I'll have to check today, but I will save you some if, if I, because I only want okay. two. I only want two or three at the most. And I know I started way more than that. So if I have any extra, I will make sure I put them aside for you and you can grab them at the plant exchange. Oh, but we can thank talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. We can talk more, you know, before then to make sure I have them. But uh, I definitely started some. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. So anything else happening? Oh, very good. Uh, just if you could give some guidance in terms of uh, planting things outside. So I, I have onions that, are well hardened off. Uh, I'm planning to plant them uh, in, outside in the ground pretty soon. You know, I know the weather fluctuates a lot. Is this a reasonable time to plant them outside at this point? Um, are you growing them from seed or from sets? Uh, I grew them from uh, from seeds. They're about uh, maybe four inches tall at this point. I've clipped them back a few times. Um, a lot of times when people grow onions from seed, before they move them out, mm -hmm. they give them a haircut. They clip the tops mm -hmm. to make them thicken up. 
uh, and make them a little bit more yeah, robust. Yeah, they, they, they already had their first haircut. So oh, okay. They're, they're All right. Well, okay. So then you're in pretty good shape. And, you know, onions can go out very early. So I would say there's, you know, if as long as you get them acclimated to outside weather, let them harden off a little bit, get used to the cold. Um, again, maybe move them outside during the day and then move them in to a cool spot at night, but not real cold, you know, just for a few days, give them a chance to get used to it. And it's not so much that it's the cold, it's that they've been grown inside. If they had been grown outside mm. from seed, you'd, you'd be fine. But um, moving them from indoor temperatures to outdoor temperatures, you want to give them a chance to adjust. And then as soon as you do that, you can stick them in the ground, ready to go, rock and roll. Very good, very good. And by the same token, if I harden off the cabbages and uh, broccoli and kale, uh, would you say they could go, when they're hardened, could they go out like this weekend? Would you recommend uh, holding off for another uh, another week or so? Or um, the weather's thoughts? been all over the place. Ordinarily, I would say mm -hmm. April 15th. This year, we had a very early mm -hmm. spring. And then we had really cold weather. <laughs> and it did a significant right, amount yeah. of damage. So I would say, you know, might as well just wait to the 15th. And then you should be okay. As long as they're hardened off, they should be okay. Okay. Yeah, they, they're doing well. They're sort of in a holding pattern. They're still they're still stocky. Uh, stocky. I can probably keep them like that uh, for another uh, another week or two. So uh, that, that's something I can do. Uh, well, thank you so much for the uh, the advice, Peggy. I do appreciate it. It's always a pleasure, Chris. And I'm looking forward to seeing you in May. It'll be fun. Really, I think we're going to have a really Absolutely. good time this year. Mm -hmm. All right. You Very have a great week. So. Thank you, Peggy. Take care now. You too. Bye-bye. You're back, so you've decided to come back. Say hi to everybody. I'm trying to drink my tea. Thank goodness it's almost all gone. All right, so now let's see. Where should we go? Let me give the phone number. It's 888-399-7344. That's Peggy, P-E-G-I. 888-399-7344. And you can, uh, you can give us a call. We have... Um, all our lines are open, so um, you can give us a call and we'll get you on the air right away. What do we want to do now? Let's, uh, yeah, let's do the chicken video. This is, okay, so let's go to the video and um, here we go. The chickens. I gave them an apple and um, I have hanging out there a, um, there we go. Um, I have, this is the door in the chicken coop. And I keep hanging in there this big metal screw. Would you call that thing a screw? Sort of screw. It's the a special screw that we use for connecting six by six. So it's almost a foot long. Is it a foot long? Um, maybe 10 inches. Yeah, like 10 inches long. And it has, uh, you know, screw blades on the bottom half of it. And so it works really well to be able, I originally hung it for cabbage, but it works equally well for apples. And uh, that, that mean rooster, there he goes. He's going in there. He's a rooster. He's a bird on the, moving away. He is the meanest rooster. His name is Ben. And uh, he's very, he's very aggressive. I'm, I'm standing by the door, taking this um, so that I can make a quick getaway if he decides to come after me. But they, uh, they really enjoyed that apple. Um, and we like to try to do different things on occasion to um, create some interest for them. Just you know, I do let them out when I can, but. Um, uh, Juniper chases the chickens. Um, Becky never did that. So I'm a little bit more limited to my options as to when I can let them out. But uh, but they have a good life and they are laying eggs again, which is also good. All right. One more time. The number 888-399-7344. Let's go to the pruning the hibiscus. Now we've had these hibiscus trees for five or six years now. And I first, um, I know actually it's longer than that because we overwintered them multiple years 
in the living room in the Ocean Grove house. And there were two big windows that face west. And they're not the sunniest windows, but at least they were big. And I would put one in front of one window and one in front of the other window. And there's no heat thing there. So they were relatively safe. And they did deteriorate over the winter, but they stayed alive. And then I would cut them back and, uh, and be able to reuse them. Now, this one um, is in worse shape than the other one. Can we make this bigger, please? So it needed it needed a pruning and also it had mealybugs and it had mealybugs and i think aphids too because that looks like aphid skeletons on the underside of that leaf and um, so it needed some help it was still making flowers you can see it has a nice healthy flower bud there on the left but um i wanted to really prune it back hard and clean it up and uh, get it ready to go on the front steps back at the Ocean Grove house again. And this is what it looked like after I finished pruning it. So I tried to give it a nice shape and tried to not take off everything, um, but, you know, take off everything that's dead um, and then kind of just shape it and make the cuts back to a, a bud so that it would branch and grow outward. And, um, and that's, that's what we did. And we got rid of all the other branches and then we fertilized it. Uh, we used a little Osmocote and one little scoop and sprinkled it around. Please note that the pot is full of pine cones. Uh, and the reason for that is that cat used to like to go in there and we've discovered that pine cones seems to be the way to go. They don't, Cat has not been bothering any of the plants since we put pine cones in them. So that's a very good thing. So we sprinkled the fertilizer, which is a slow release fertilizer. And then we hose that baby down, watered the fertilizer in also, but really hosed it down. Um, I washed each individual leaf, which there weren't a lot of leaves left, so it wasn't that big of a job. But um, I prefer water as my first line of attack for getting rid of insects whenever possible. Um, soapy water comes next and alcohol comes after that before I resort to any kind of synthetic pesticide or even Sagfer's insecticidal soap, which is, you know, which is why I use dish detergent instead of Safer's insecticidal soap. But the whole idea is the fierce spray of water really does a lot and uh, nobody minds spraying water. So. But then I took those pictures um, two weeks ago, a week ago, a week ago. I had the slides ready for last week's show and didn't use them. So now it's been about a week and a half since I did the actual pruning. And what to my wondering eyes should appear? But look, I've already got buds. You see those buds? See, I pruned them back to a place where there was a bud. The one on the right there is... Um, there was a leaf that was left, but it's sending up buds uh, in addition, um, both where the leaf is and then one leaf node further back. And uh, in the picture on the left of the screen, you can see one significant bud. And if you look directly below that, kind of um, to the right side of the main stem there, you can see a little tiny hint of green. It's resprouting already. So I'm quite comfortable uh with the idea that by the time we're ready to move it to ocean grove at the end of may that it should be looking pretty good and be ready to flower by the middle of the summer at least so um i was very pleased with that um okay i think that's it right that's the last one okay so we have 11 minutes left so i'm going to give the phone number again it's 888 399 7344 so we can take some of your garden questions but the last thing that i want to do is let's do pineapples came across this information about pineapples and just found it somewhat comical and entertaining so we're going to uh talk about pineapples in the united kingdom stealing pineapples used to be a serious crime it was actually considered a felony it was really serious crime. And that was from like the 1400s to the late 1800s. And in the 1700s, 
pineapples were valued at 60 to 80 pounds each, or in today's dollars, that's 17 to 23,000 per pineapple. That is a lot of money for pineapple. And in 1807, John Godding was sentenced to seven years in a penal colony in Australia because he stole seven pineapples. That's that's pretty serious punishment for stealing pineapples. But pineapples are native to South America and getting pineapples to England was difficult and they weren't able to grow them in England. And so uh, they were considered a representation of wealth and status. And so people were coveting them and really wanted to have pineapples. And they were, um, they were used as centerpieces on, on the table to uh, demonstrate one's position in society, how high up you were. Really kind of ridiculous, but, and, but, but this is what was happening. So actually a whole different kind of industry developed where you could rent pineapples. There were shops for renting pineapples so that people could have a pineapple as a centerpiece uh, simply to impress their friends. And then of course they would have to give it back. I found no indication that anyone ever ate the pineapples, but, but this is what they were used for. So by the late 1800s, they figured out how to grow pineapples in England in, you know, a greenhouse kind of situation. And yet they were still importing more than ever. So between refrigeration and canning, pineapples became much more accessible. And um, I don't think anybody was sent to any more penal colonies after that. But um, you can see here that they're they're growing in sort of a greenhouse situation. I don't know if this is in somebody's home. Uh, they can be propagated pretty easily from the top of an existing pineapple. And I have produced one pineapple in my life. It was about the size of a tangerine, but it was a pineapple. Unfortunately, the whole poor thing was covered in mealybugs and I just decided to get rid of it. And it took a long time. I didn't have an ideal growing environment. I was in an apartment um, in graduate school. Um, I was so thrilled that the pineapple was there, but you know, it's also a very mean plant. You brush up against that, you bleed. So it wasn't, it didn't make the best house plant. And today the Philippines and Costa Rica are considered the largest producers of pineapples in the world. Um, yes, we think of uh, pineapples being grown in Hawaii and there was a huge uh, pineapple industry in Hawaii. Um, Dole did a lot of pineapple canning, but apparently they don't do that in Hawaii very much anymore. Um, the cost of operating canning facilities became cost prohibitive and other countries can produce uh, canned pineapples at a fraction of the cost of what it takes to in the United States. So that's why these are being produced in other countries. However, Hawaii does still produce a fair number of fresh market pineapples. So that is the story of how pineapples, you could go get sent to a penal colony over a dumb old pineapple. I mean, I like pineapples, don't get me wrong, but I don't think they're worth going to jail over. Oh, there was a caller, they went away? No? Okay, so do we have anything else? All right, well, we still have six minutes. So what should we do? What should we do next? Uh, let's do the planting of seeds because uh, a lot of that going on right now. So I decided to try uh, a couple of things that were different with planting of seeds. Um, I've always used, for the last few years, I've used egg cartons and, and they work. And I, I got some really good results with that, but I also found that the each individual cell was kind of small and they dried out very quickly. And, and that was a little bit problematic. Um, and since we are big fans of uh, takeout food, um, I have a lot of these, I end up recycling them, but decided to try using some of these as uh, containers for starting seed. So th the tops of this kind actually have already pre-cut holes in them. And the purpose of that is to let any excess 
heat or steam out so that anything that's in the container doesn't get soggy. That's why they have the holes in the top so that any excess heat can go out and um, for transportation from wherever they originated to your home, the crunchy part, whatever that might be, stays crunchy. And so I cut them in half and used the, uh, the top with the holes in it as the part where I put the soil in and the bottom as a tray. So I just cut them apart and I was so disappointed because I, I went to the big box store to buy bamboo markers and they didn't have any. So I used these plastic forks and they, they work pretty well. And, you know, with a magic marker, um, a permanent marker and um, kind of cool because the forky part really holds the thing in place nicely. And so, you know, I ended up finding something else to use that I preferred, but hey, in a pinch, you know, figure it out. And so I also, do you, do you read what that says? Can you read what that says on the left? I hope Chris is looking. Nardello. Jimmy Nardello pepper. So I'm hoping, you know, I put a whole bunch of seed in there. So again, I only need two or three and they should be coming up soon. So I will transplant out a few and put them aside for, for Chris. Um, so these are all three different kinds of peppers. So the Corbacci is on the right, the Jimmy Nardello is on the left, and then Ozark Giant in the middle for like stuffing. So my broccoli and cauliflower came up great. I'm not sure about the peppers yet. They always take a little bit longer to germinate. But um, I think this is, a, you know, an alternative system to using the egg cartons. And I'm pretty pleased with it. Is that, does that bring us to the end? Okay. So I will keep you posted and let you know as to how that is going. Um, what else? Do we have anything that we can do quick here? Let's uh, slide down. Lace, uh, oh, necklace. Yeah, let's do the necklace one. All right, this is um, a crassula. It's related to the jade plant, and I was. It's a beautiful plant. I love this plant. It's easy. It's in a good spot. It makes a good hanging plant, um, and it's in it, it's in a perfect spot for it. Um, so it makes me very happy to look at it. But I was walking by and out of the corner of my eye, I spied that the spot was, it was producing roots, you know, just like in the air. So I decided to uh, cut that branch off. And I cut the whole branch off because I didn't, I didn't want it to be sticking out like a stump, you know, just cutting it off by the root. So I, I took it way back and I took the, the cutting and that's what I had. So I cut it again right below the roots and potted that up with the roots in the, in the soil. And there it is. Looks happy. And um, again, I don't, I don't, need another one of these so i will either keep it as a giveaway for when i visit people or when people come to the greenhouse when people come to the greenhouse for the first time i i like them to leave with something to remember it by so i often give these little succulents away but i have so many for the plant exchange next and then the other one i cut in half and just laid on the surface of the pot um, this I did this a few weeks ago, and the little one is doing fine, and they both look quite viable. But neither one, neither of these two, have actually started to sprout yet. But they seem to be doing okay, so we will see how they go. But this is um, a lovely little plant, and as you know, jade plants in the jade family propagate pretty easily. So I'm very optimistic that by the time we get to the plant exchange, that this one, these will have rooted as well. Maybe I'll transplant them and make two, you know, once it gets started, but we'll, we'll see. But um, the other one, the little one's doing great. So I think that's the end of the slides, right? Is that the end? All right, so that brings us up exactly to 11 o'clock. So a lot going on. Hopefully the weather is going to improve because, you know, the amount of rain that we've had has been made doing anything outside extremely difficult. 
um, standing water, everything drenched. Um, but it's really time to start getting some stuff in the ground. And I have some more transplanting that I need to do. I still haven't gotten the sarcococca in the woods, but maybe I'd be able to get to that this week. So to everybody, uh, remember to like and subscribe. And remember, you can always email me if you have any additional questions or uh, text if you have the number and send me pictures and I will be happy to share them and we can discuss your problems on the air. And I will be here next week, same time, same place. Until then, have a good one.